We generally know that the term inflation refers to changes in an aggregate or average price level in an economy. And specifically, inflation is the growth rate or the percent change in that price level. But what's less obvious is what we use as that average or aggregate price level in order to calculate inflation. And actually, we have a few options for that. So let's talk about a couple of them and see how they differ and what the pros and cons of each are. One way to measure the price level in an economy is via the GDP deflator. The GDP deflator is equal to nominal GDP, or gross domestic product measured in today's dollars, divided by real GDP, or gross domestic product measured in a particular base year constant dollars, all of that times 100. In macroeconomics, we refer to nominal GDP as P times Y, and we refer to real GDP as Y, so what we see with the GDP deflator is it just simplifies to P times Y divided by Y times 100, which is just P times 100. So what we're actually seeing is that the GDP deflator is some measure of the aggregate price level, not surprisingly represented by P times 100. We could also measure the price level in an economy via what's known as the consumer price index. And the consumer price index takes a basket of goods and services that the representative household in an economy would consume and then takes the cost of that basket in the current year, so using current prices, and divides that by the cost of the basket in what's defined as a base year, takes all of that and then multiplies by 100. Because, of course, the cost of the basket of goods and services is dependent on the prices of the items in that basket, the consumer price index, as its name would suggest, gives us a measure of an average or aggregate price level in the economy. Coming back to talk about inflation specifically, which we said was the growth rate of a price level, we could say that one way to measure inflation is to calculate the percent change in the consumer price index. And actually, mathematically, that would be the same as calculating the percent change in the cost of the basket of goods and services itself. Even though this is the way that the inflation we usually see reported is generally calculated, it's not the only possible way to calculate inflation. For example, we could also calculate inflation by looking at the percent change in the GDP deflator that we talked about earlier. Notice that the GDP deflator is P times 100, but mathematically that's equivalent to just looking at inflation as the percent change in that measure of P itself. These two different ways of calculating inflation are going to give different numbers, of course. But it's also important to understand conceptually how these two measures differ from one another so we can decide which one is the appropriate one to use in any given situation. One relevant feature of the consumer price index is that it counts goods that are imported or purchased from other countries and produced in other countries. And this is because if you think about the stuff that you consume as a household, some of that may be made in the economy where you live, but other items may have been made elsewhere and then imported into the country. Similarly, because the consumer price index looks at items that households purchase, the consumer price index and therefore inflation calculated using the consumer price index doesn't count what I'll call industrial goods or things that are bought by businesses to make the stuff that they ultimately sell to consumers. Because gross domestic product or GDP specifically looks at domestic production, inflation calculated using the GDP deflator is going to count all of the things that are domestically produced in an economy. And what that means is that this measure of inflation would count exports or things that are produced domestically and sold to other countries, 
but won't count imports because imports are not produced in the domestic economy and therefore don't enter into GDP. Because economies tend to produce both things that households consume directly, but also things that are used by businesses to make more stuff, inflation calculated using the GDP deflator is going to count both what I'll call household and industrial goods. So it includes more than just things that households typically purchase. It also includes things that businesses purchase as long as those things are produced in the domestic economy. Now that we understand the conceptual differences between these two measures of inflation, we can think about in what circumstances each one is most appropriate. Because inflation calculated using the consumer price index specifically measures the prices of things that households typically consume, this is a helpful measure of inflation because it's the measure that we can think of as representing changes in you know, the, just the cost of living in an economy. Granted, this is somewhat of an imperfect measure of changes in cost of living, mainly because we assume that the basket of goods and services that households consume is constant over time and doesn't respond to price changes in the economy. Whereas in reality, households probably optimize and substitute away from items that got relatively more expensive and substitute towards items that got relatively cheaper in an economy. Note, however, that when we talk about inflation in the context of our aggregate demand and aggregate supply model in macroeconomics, we're implicitly talking about a measure of inflation based on the GDP deflator rather than based on the consumer price index. And we can see that because in our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model is shown here, what we're graphing is real GDP Y versus this measure of the price level P, and so that's the relevant measure of the price level that we're looking at specifically in this context. 